TLDR, Kojima was right. Metal Gear Solid 2 continues to predict everything. I played that game when I was like 10 or 11. It has inspired my entire method of thinking so far. And I'm just kind of thinking, man, if, I, if only I knew when I was playing it for the first time that it was a message from Kojima to what we could stop from happening... <laughs> It's brutal. Well, everybody, this is uh, actually quite fascinating, and I could immediately start by saying, your gamer rights and freedoms are under assault. Less so, but we do actually have to engage with this, because this, uh, no joke, is something that is approaching us in the future. I mean, whenever NVIDIA have a new presentation about their GPUs, even for the ones focused at us, like the, the RTX series, one of the things they talk about is machine learning capabilities, AI accelerated stuff, right? Like, they always do talk about that. Even DLSS is based off a whole bunch of like neural net stuff that they're doing. All of this, of course, is that GPUs and the way that they are incredible at parallelizing tasks just means that they're really, really well suited to this sort of thing. But the problem is AI is good, right? But what happens when AI is turbo good beyond what we currently have right now? I would ask you to compare the mid journey equivalent like Night Cafe a year ago to mid journey now. Imagine what mid journey will be like in the future. ChatGPT has been really blowing people away. But here's the thing, ChatGPT is absolutely peanuts compared to some of what the likes of Google are rumored to have internally. I mean, there's ChatGPT4 that's a thing, and there's Google's, I forget exactly what it is, but it's got a very, you know, woo spooky name uh, that basically just does code. And this is super powerful in terms of a capability. And as our technology increases, what happens is the ability for a single person to enact some form of uh, tomfoolery at scale only increases. And that is where we actually get to today's story, where OpenAI are talking about something coming in the future that as a society we're going to have to deal with. And as gamers, it actually impacts us directly because it impacts the GPUs that run our games today. Right, here's the deal. So this kind of blew my mind, Matt, whenever you brought it up. It's a open AI paper. It's called Generative Language Models and Automated Influence Operations, Emerging Threats and Potential Mitigations. So what's it about? Basically, as you can get from emerging threats and potential mitigations, open AI decided to go, okay, well, this is getting a bit spooky with generative language and influence operations. It's not hilarious considering uh, they're making it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. Uh, obviously, they're the ones who are deep in there. They're the ones who know. They're the researchers. They know everything in the field. And they're yeah. like, oh, shit. Things are getting a little bit spooky. So now they're going, okay, well, how do we deal with this? How do we stop this from going very bad? Because yeah. anyone who thinks about it will go, okay, well, yeah, you can generate text. Anyone who's seen any of like the deep fake video stuff going on or any of the like AI generated voices that are based off real voices, you go, oh no, we are in for some fun times whenever people with good motiv good motivations uh, and good like incentives aren't involved. But as soon as it goes, oh, what if a bad actor once has one of these and has unlimited access to it? Oh shit, yeah. we're in for very bad times. And that stuff's already happening and has been happening for years with bots and social media platforms. Like modern yeah. deepfakes and th synthesized voices like with the, the most recent ones that I forget the name of the, the service, but I mean, I say boomers, people only five, 10 years older than us, they're fooled. In many cases, they are fooled by it. It's honestly, it requires a pretty substantial level of expertise and awareness to understand like what to listen for, what to look for to see something's wrong. If you take something at face value because there's a, say, a trustworthy source has given it to you in the sense of, oh, hey, look what I found. This is, you say, your friend talking. Oh, hey, look what I found. Look at this. There's a decent chance people go, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to question that. That's fine. Oh, hey, how many newsrooms have published ARMA footage thinking <laughs> it was real, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so I think we're already at a stage where actually the majority of the population overall of the planet could be fooled by this sort of thing. And it is only going to get better. And it's not going to get better slowly. It is, in fact, going to get better very, very rapidly indeed. And this actually does start to lead us to emerging, potentially existential threats. These are the sort of things where it's like, okay, how the hell are we going to deal with this? And ultimately, I think these open AI guys, there may be, you know, there may be thinking about Oppenheimer. Right? Mm -hmm. They may be thinking about the Manhattan Project. Yeah. They may be thinking, like, what happens when we unleash this thing into the world? What will it do? The difference, though, is that in the Manha with the Manhattan Project, you know, vast 
resources. I think it was one of the most like expensive endeavors done in history at its, you know, at its time. But now the cost to access that sort of thing in a grand scale is utterly peanuts. And that is why the OpenAI people are trying to work out what they can do here. So one of their ideas is to actually heavily limit hardware, making it so that government contracts would be required to buy large quantities of GPUs. So of course, there are things right now um, where you need a license because of harms that you could do. You know, what? maybe YouTube gets, but you know, those things. Yeah. You know, the, the, do the boom, the boom sticks. I'd say I actually think there's a better, uh, a more fitting analogy for this. There was someone on the casual UK subreddit who got a visit from the police because they bought, I think it was fertilizer. And then I think it was between six and eight months later, they bought some, uh, I can't remember what chemical it was. But it was, some, it was a decent quantity of, not bleach, but something similar. And one was for a fish tank, and the fertilizer was for the plants they were growing. And the police showed up to them to their like house, completely unannounced, just going, hey, we saw what you uh, bought there over the past year. Mind explaining what it was? And they were able to go, okay, well, fertilizer was for these plants, as you can see here. Here's the bag. This chemical was for the fish tank. I was cleaning it. Yeah. But that's like, imagine you buy, say, three graphics carts. And suddenly the police show up and go, what are you doing with those graphics cards? Is that uh, any interest in AI by any chance? That's like, if that's something that's already happening for chemicals, and that has on a relatively small scale, they obviously, you know, you make an experience. You think about you breaking make, bad stuff, bad, yeah. having to go around all the different shops and yep. do all the things. They're actually kind of talking about that sort of uh, that sort of thing, where mm -hmm. if you wanted to purchase a large quantity of GPUs, and what's kind of funny here is this initially came up in a discussion between us because it was basically like, oh yeah, scalping will be impossible because actually you would not be able to scalp mass quantities of GPUs because if this sort of thing was to happen, that would not be a thing that you could do without some form of license. Mm -hmm. Now we then get to a really interesting thing about pragmatism, uh, versus freedom, right? Because the idea of like, let's just say, I don't know, uh, I obviously, if I say, let's say you want to mine crypto, obviously not really done as much in GPUs for, for a lot of that now. And obviously that is something that comes with a lot more baggage than it did a few years ago. But let's say if somebody wanted to do that and wanted to buy a bunch of GPUs or was just really interested in deploying something th themselves and I don't know, they were rich and could afford the GPUs, uh, a lot of us would have this reflex of, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me? Government says I cannot buy that many GPUs. Are you insane? But then what happens? Again, I'm thinking, you know, this is like 10 years, 20 years. Think about what a GPU was like 20 years ago, by the way. Remember what yeah. games looked like back then? You know, we went from GoldenEye to, uh, well, modern games. Yeah, well, I don't want to break your heart. GoldenEye was actually closer to 30 years ago when I bought it. Okay, you know? <laughs> fair. Well, that is a little bit heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, the other thing that they talk about is to force a proof of personhood on online content, setting up a standard to have indicators of authenticity, which would be the sort of thing that's killing anonymity. Now, mm. if you are, because I know a lot of uh, the people who watch this channel do, uh, you know, they know about us from our Warcraft content. Mm. And many of them will remember uh, Battle.net whenever they wanted to have like actual, uh, essentially just like forum avatar stuff that is you. Real ID. Yeah, it's called Real ID and the community absolutely said, uh, excuse me, rock flag and eagle, absolutely not. Uh, yeah. This is, I mean, in a way, almost just saying, this is goddamn un-American. We won't have it. Yeah, you're- <laughs> And yeah. of course, you know, outside of America, pretty much everybody also said no as well. It's, you know, obviously framing it for dramatic effect. But now we get to the funky stage where the ability to do disproportionate harm, like you no longer have to have a sophisticated botnet. You know, you don't have to uh, recruit every smart fridge in the land to do your, your deeds. And this, this is sort of emerging throughout they're talking about. They say, for malicious actors looking to spread propaganda, information designed to shape perceptions to further an actor's interest, these language models bring the promise of automating the creation of convincing and misleading text for influence operations rather than having to rely on human labor. And the thing there is, human labor can scale, but controversial human labor scales dangerously and can get you busted. Yeah. Right? Whereas with this, you literally just need to have a box in the corner. Again, think about how good 
I mean, the 4090 right now, it's a chunker. Imagine a GPU in 10 years. Yeah. It's actually hard to imagine. Yeah, and it's not even that. They say, uh, they actually specifically, to skip a little bit ahead, they say that fine-tuning a small model can result in better results than large models, which basically means you may not need all of that much computational power once the algorithms and once the like architecture gets better and the data gets better. So it's not even a case of, oh yeah, well, like right now you'll need a warehouse full of GPUs or anything major. But in the near future, it's like, hey, you've got a, what's that? You've got a, you've got a PS5, an Xbox Series X and a gaming PC hooked up together. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I think one of the worrying things is, you know, right now, a lot of these influence ops are limited to state actors. Um, I think there is a very obvious uh, context as we look through the last few years and especially the current day and some of the countries involved. You know what I mean, right? Again, you know. They're listening. <laughs> Don't want to piss off the algorithm, right? But that's all a real thing. It's a real problem that we've got to deal with. Now, what happens when that is democratized to the point where absolutely anybody can do it? Then we actually get into a fairly strange situation where barrier to entry almost uh, is something that like promotes authenticity. So you could actually flip back around because right now people are saying, you know, I'll oh, screw the legacy media, right? Screw the establishment. We don't need this stuff. But then what happens when the internet gets so unreliable because you can have a box in the corner that is outputting, you know, 50,000, 100,000 humans worth of specifically intelligently tailored garbage. What happens then? Things start to get a lot less trustworthy. Now, obviously, a lot will be done to fight this. Mm -hmm. I mean, take... Take Twitter. They obviously had a massive bot problem. They probably do still have a bot problem. All the big social media platforms have bot problems. It's going to become extremely hard for them to do anything. And this is actually a massive barrier to entry for really any new entrance in some of these markets. Because not only do you have to scale up your social media platform or do whatever, but you have to fight the fact that you're almost immediately going to be invested by bots that are, just like right now, think about bots, like they're pathetic. You know, it's it's always just, for the Facebook ones anyway, it's always just like random pictures of hot women and it's all very sus and full of links. And that's just what bots are like. And anybody knows what's up with a bot. That's fine. But like I, to hit another example. So I don't know what it's uh, like over in the States, but I certainly know that here in uh, like, you know, UK and Ireland, a lot of spam calls happen. There was a really popular one that went uh, around a while ago, it was orchestrated from India, I believe, where they were impersonating HMRC. So if you're uh, you know, in the US, that would be the same as uh, the IR, Inland Revenue and Customs? I IRS. The IRS, yeah. yes, that's it. Oh, yeah, Internal Revenue Service? Yes. Yeah. So impersonating that to basically say, oh, you know, you have an unpaid tax thing, you have to do this right now, and they try to scare people. And here's the deal. You become used to scams being ran out of foreign countries that are just not particularly convincing if you're clued into the internet. Now, those scams get people my age. They, they actually do get people in and around our age. They get loads of people who are, 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 who are older. Now, what happens when one of these scams can be done by a chatbot with a human synthesized voice that when over the telephone with that compression is essentially indistinguishable from, uh, you know, from reality to the point where a finely tuned model can intelligently respond to what the person does in order to effectuate its uh, the, uh, the desired outcome. Mm -hmm. Then you have a situation where in the same way that somebody would just have a GPU, you know, mining in the corner, you could have a GPU farming the elderly in the corner. Mm -hmm. What a dire thought that is. Like I get Jeez. text messages all the time. And I know you do as well, yep. cold calls. But imagine these things become super powered and they become intelligent, like to the point where maybe the uh, the Turing test is easily passed. Hmm. Like we're pretty much there already. Yeah, we're getting like, I guess as the rate of improvement, as the rate of change increases, it's going to be getting uh, crazier and crazier. And I think what really shows that off is uh, to t just to take a look at some of these things. So they're arguing that improvements are on three levels, right? Um, data. So that just means more training data. I think a good example, oh, was it Apple and OpenAI? Oh dear. Recently oh, it was... podcasting? That was, I believe it was 
Apple were using a Spotify-owned platform and in the uh, podcast platform. Oh, so Apple and Spotify can work together. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Huh. There is a, uh, there's something in the contract in the terms of service that people didn't notice that was if you upload a podcast on the platform, you agree to be in the training model, in the training data. And then they went, hey, look what we can do. I can't remember exactly what it is they announced, but it is more or less, hey, look what we can do. We've got this uh, podcast AI so we can get, get all that stuff going and set up. And then was like, you're using our data? Like, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone who started a podcast over the pandemic. And, you know, I, I want to talk about, you know, I almost want to talk about Bond villains, you know, like Spectre <laughs> and, you know, the Rami Malek character yeah. in the most recent one. The ability for somebody to just start doing Bond villain stuff is crazy. Now, to look at this, and they also talk about, by the way, algorithms getting better, neural network architecture uh, getting better, and then computational power getting better. So here is the progression of uh, synthetic face generation from, like, you look at this and you think, wow, that's shit. Oh, it's 2014. 2021, that's in, in that's indistinguishable from reality, essentially, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, hey, once they crack hands, it's all over. <laughs> yeah. Um, to even take a look here at uh, image generation from language. I mean, look at these. These are like, you know, you, you, you squint your eyes. You're like, oh, oh I, that, that kind of looks like a bus. Now it now it's a bus. Recently, then one of these that was found on Amazon was uh, Joe Rogan and Andrew Huberman talking nice. together about um, you know what we could call uh, manhood enhancing supplements. Of course, this was all BS, total BS. But the way that the script was done was actually kind of impressive. Mm -hmm. um, I remember it was actually Luke and Linus on a recent WAN show where they were doing the AI voices, and what surprised me because it was one of those ones it biases. It kind of moves everything towards a certain American accent. Uh, but what surprised me... Does that. Yeah, Eleven Labs. What surprised me was it actually got Luke's intonation. The way that he says, like, uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, all of those kind of the sounds we make between words. It got those quite convincingly. So we'll get to the point where, as you are combining actors, behavior, and content, it will get to the stage where credibility is... You know, it will be nearing impossible for somebody to verify. Yeah, it'll be impossible for somebody to verify without us having some sort of uh, system. And then what do you have? Do you an ad have an ad hoc setup of systems ran by private, uh, you know, by the private sector? Or does the government actually say, um, all right, social security, online passport. And again, I'm not particularly advocating for any of these things. A lot mm -hmm. of them seem utterly horrific to me and open to, I mean, obviously what, uh, you know, what Snowden leaked. Can you imagine even the increase, say, in, you know, so you could say state power, right? Um, how humongous that would be in a world where the state has also got to work out how to defend, I suppose, its own credibility and the safety of its population. What sort of things could it do in, you know, in that goal? And it has always been for you know for the, the longest story of what leads us to uh, forms of tyranny is, you know, it is the oh, save the children. Oh, we're doing this for your own protection. It is that kind of thing. And uh, you know, as as much as some people might meme and like, okay, what next? You're going to have a cap that says, you know, woman love me, fish fear me. You're going to have <laughs> underwear that says, don't tread on me. Uh, <laughs> but then you're like, well, hang on a second. Some of these threats are actually kind of substantive. And here we have people who are at the forefront of research in this field uh, saying, hey, everyone, we're at the forefront of research in this field. And and by the way, it's not just them doing it. OpenAI may be the one that everybody knows about, especially because of their recent partnership with Microsoft. But again, Google are like ahead in their yeah. internal tools here. Like Google basically have the scary demon machine. Yeah, this paper, we don't have it in the doc, but this paper does have a, a table of, I think it's like size of model and how much computational power is involved across what they know is publicly and privately available. And it's like, hey, hey, look at the size of all of these. This is absolutely crazy. This is absolutely completely insane. But I think to me, it always falls back to, uh, again, it's, it has to be Metal Gear Solid because you play Metal Gear Solid 4 and it's all this kind of idea. Metal Gear Solid 2 talks so much about data control and information control. And it is that of now someone with a thing can control the information. So it boils down to someone has to control the information. Who's that going to be? Because if you let it be anyone, then it can be anyone. But if you let it be someone, then there's a single point of failure. And you go, 
Uh, oh, 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 okay. I, you know, oh, it's dear. that thing where people, I think they look at Kojima and they, they think like, really? Die Hartman? Hot Coldman? Really? The, the big enemy is Big Boss, who is called Big Boss because he was better than his mentor, Boss. And you, you know, you'd almost roll your eyes and like, yeah, well, of course, Escape from New York was the blueprint for this. But then you actually do dive into the many of the ideas, the high level concepts that he engages with. And that's where you find why that series is so beloved, yeah. where things that now open AI researchers are talking about. Really, Kojima was kind of, uh, as I got to over deify the man, yeah. but like he was he was barking up this tree. Quite a while ago, he was barking up this tree. While in 2001, also, yeah, yeah, like while also doing some property subversive stuff. Yeah, um, like, <laughs> you know, like almost on the on the meta level, like you know all that stuff about like you know the discs and the PS2 and all of that. Yes, I mean stuff like uh, I think the most notable in Metal Gear Solid One was you needed the uh, codec number in the manual, but this wasn't very. This wasn't like obviously pointed out directly. So we could talk honestly. I could talk for Kojima, like in the game design stuff is interesting for days. But I think to avoid deifying him, a lot of it because is he really engages the media. He always talks about films he's seeing. He always talks about books he's reading, and he used to read a lot of sci-fi. So you can tell a lot of concepts come from sci-fi novels, which I think everyone's aware that sci-fi novels are mostly, you know, uh, philosophers who want to make money end up writing sci-fi because they're thinking about the future, they're thinking about possibility, they're thinking of these concepts taken to the highest level, is it, and then narrativizing them. Sh Shishin Lu? Oh, the I Dark Forest? Uh, dark Forest, yeah. uh, you know, the three-body problem. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like, oh, some actually fucking <laughs> big, heady stuff. Yeah. Um, a, lot of, a lot of boundaries are being pushed by mm. modern science fiction right now. Yep. And uh, I, I think one of the issues, though, is... It sometimes gets so conceptual; it's hard to hard to grapple with. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have to grapple with it, you know. As as you see here, um, I think a show that engages with some of this, perhaps more in the philosophical level than the realistic, like this is going to happen, uh, would be devs. Oh, of course, yes. Which, you know, for reasons we'll call devs. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that idea of you know, like, okay, but what happens when you create the box that we're already inside? And you, where, there's a bit in that show <laughs> where the penny drops, and it's like, oh. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately what this would mean for you then is governments having to impose access controls on AI hardware, right? Um, maybe prevent some future models uh, from being developed altogether, restrictions and semiconductors that could escalate geopolitical tensions and hurt legitimate business. So that's a big issue there. And a really good example, of course, is very much in the news because of geopolitical stuff, uh, TSMC, yes. uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. Something that's like 40% of the world's silicon, maybe it's 50%, uh, is, is them. And they have the, I believe, the most advanced fabs, or at least ones that can run at scale. Um, that would be very bizarre for their business. And yep. I, I have a feeling what we will end up with is rather than very generic function, AI accelerator, neural network thing, I think we will have to move in the direction of regulated fixed function stuff that has a way on the very basic hardware level to essentially kill itself um, if the bad is going to happen. I think that's one of the only ways that perhaps you can have your iPhone that uses loads of neural net stuff to process lots of info from that camera and many different frames that it's taken into one. Like if you've used any modern flagship smartphone, there's a lot of AI stuff going on in there. I mean, mm. some people would say it's not AI if it's a neural net, but you know, whatever, I don't wanna split hairs on that. Um, it is the sort of thing that would be relevant in this context. They would need a way that that couldn't be co-opted. Remember back when people were joking about like, oh, the US Army bought a bunch of PS3s because they could run Linux, do cool stuff. Which they actually literally did. There are pictures of the racks like it. Yeah, It did yeah. happen, yeah. But I think that's- and It turns that's, out, you know, what. Adams WMDs were in fact a shed full of PS2s. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's that's a case where, like, if we're trying to dig into what this actually literally means, is that they, the, I think the TLDR for what OpenAI is reporting is, and this is literally, like, they're not saying to do this, they're saying, here's the things we may need to do to stop this if it gets any worse, or to mitigate the issue going forward. They're not advocating for it. But the TLDR is they consider compute power dangerous in the wrong hands. It should become a managed resource. And they think that's feasible. Like, as you said, TSMC, 40, 50% of the world's semiconductors, they say it is an extremely concentrated supply chain. 
which means whoever controls that, almost in the same sense of the Ace Combat universe, where whoever controls the the weapon system that'll shoot down the meteor controls the world. It'll be whoever has control over this is going to be able to say, okay, well, you get the you get the stuff that'll end the world, you get the stuff that'll end the world, you not so much. And that could trickle down the whole way to being okay, well, we're gonna okay, here's a shipment of semiconductors, we're gonna send it out. And there's just a row of people from different countries and different jurisdictions going, hang on a second, we didn't inspect that. Where's it going? Why? Yeah. And that means if you look at, say, say NVIDIA, as an example, like, hey, we need a load of semiconductors for GPUs. All of a sudden, you would have the amount of oversight going into NVIDIA's entire, like, process. Every single bit of input, every single bit of output would be insane. It's in, like, the way that there yeah. is a nuclear commission. Yep. yep. There likely would end up being something here um, and it's the sort of thing, I understand this is very heady and shocking, but hmm. do you remember being 13? Maybe now you're, you're 23 or maybe you're 33. Think about how much some of this stuff has changed. Hmm. Like imagine if you brought, I remember when I had the Motorola Razor, right? Way back in yeah. the day, you know, the flip phone. Now, if I was to show an iPhone 14 Pro Max to me back then, as well as a Steam Deck, which, I mean, maybe that wouldn't be as mind-blowing because the mm. idea of a handheld console is a thing. But even, say, chat GPT. Mm. Like, whenever I was in school, you were not allowed a laptop in school. And you weren't allowed a calculator <laughs> in exams. Like, the world has changed shockingly in a tiny amount of time. I would then say, well, if you're 33 now, imagine or try to imagine what will it be like when I'm 53 and if you're 33, how is the world different from when you were, uh, you know, when you were 13? And I think it's that sort of thing. We are like frogs, the, the frog in the boiling pot. A lot of it catches us off guard. And it's always been the case that technology and these capabilities vastly outpace uh, the level that society actually grows to adapt to it. Mm. And I think that ultimately is why these access controls and hardware, I mean, even think about this from the perspective of a country like Japan. I'm not sure what Japan's rare earth metal situation is like, but I know that they are quite dependent on TSMC. Extremely and uh, a lot of the rare earth metal supply chain, I believe, uh, is like quite concentrated in China. Uh, they're they're so called rare some. earth metals for a reason. Yeah. Uh, it's like until, yeah, I don't know, we capture an asteroid full of goodies. Yeah, I think... Like, it, we are actually kind of stuck in the rock we're on. Yeah, I think if we were to use, like, uh, I guess modern... RPG terms, we wouldn't say rare, because that's just a dime a dozen. It's a legendary earth metals, I think, maybe a bit closer. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, um, and that is definitely going to lead you to geopolitical tensions, as is being pointed out here, and it's hilarious that all of this touches on gaming. But it does at the end of the day, because it's gaming awful. has... Consumer products and gaming have driven technology forward in the certain way that those, uh, I think they're called nudie videos, uh, uh, yes. vastly adopted VHS. Cause blue movies. Blue movies. <laughs> and I want you to think about those blue movies. Really, kids, no. no. But think about how they were distributed back at that time. You know, there was no online, um, one could say, a sort of hub that people were just going to that, uh, like, because you look at the traffic. Like the traffic breakdowns, the internet, it is, people are Oh, it's heart, horny. heartbreaking. Yeah, it's pretty heartbreaking. Um, before any of that existed, it was magazines and whatever form of video, be it, uh, you know, Betamax or VHS. And because that industry, one of the reasons I know is that industry chose VHS and that massively drove adoption. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, gaming. How much more do we need as uh, uh, GPUs because of the games industry? So what you're so what you're really saying it's is games and film. It was the uh, obviously film animation and stuff and all of graphics work is going to be important to it. But what you're saying is the point in maybe was it around 2006 to 2010, maybe 2012. The industry as a whole decided against most of our wishes as video game players to focus entirely on graphic f graphical fidelity as opposed to any of the other important parts of video games. That's actually what sparked the end of the world coming. Way That's quicker. it. They they <laughs> will say, wow, whenever the piss filter came in for two th late 2000s gaming, that truly was the end of the human civilization. Yeah. There you go. Oh, wait, I can blame Square Enix because they, the, they did the whole thing with the Titans. The NVIDIA Titans, and they had that big, massive graphical showcase. I can blame Square Enix for the end of the world. Square Enix, <laughs> as it turns out, is guilty for ending humanity. Yep. 
I think on, on a slightly more serious note, although this is quite serious, in terms of what it actually means to the GPU market is the best case is the GPUs have to undergo extreme change to avoid being in any way connected to any of this, which will likely means graphical capabilities set back a little bit in exchange for them being more specific fixed function hardware, as opposed to having all of this insane stuff attached to it, but also pretty hardcore limits on what's there. Yeah. In the same way that uh, NVIDIA, I think, did both NVIDIA AMD try to limit uh, Bitcoin mining through firmware stuff, and then some of it got crack cracked and some of it didn't. Mm. I think it'll be a little bit like that, where best case, GPUs will be very weird in 10 years, but hopefully they should have us roughly left alone, maybe. And then worst case, Torment Nexus and the world's over in four years. So, yeah. you know, somewhere in the middle of this. Look, this may seem completely unhinged for us to be talking about on and this gaming news channel. And it sort of is, but it also isn't. Because as you can see here, the same technology that runs our video games is also running the things that these very smart people are talking about. Maybe but there's an ounce of scaremongering in here. But I think if you play around with chat GPT yourself and you think about what that, you know, what could happen there and that's deployed at scale, these are real worries and they're ones that may impact you because of their societal impact, their legislative impact, and also well, impact our video games. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, I suppose that bit's why we're here. Yeah. Do you know what would be a really good bombshell to end this video on? Oh, I love those. MGS2 style, we're actually AI the whole time. Unfortunately, it's not that good just yet. Unfortunately. It's not that good, but I actually did try to clone my voice at one point because yep. uh, sometimes what happens, right? Maybe I'm not in the office, so I can't record a video and our editors don't have anything to edit to. There's times I thought, well, why don't I just text a speech myself? That can work as scratch audio so the editors don't have to wait for me to go into the office because they can just hit the Michael speak word button. And then I record the real thing and it could be a useful production tool. But you can all see how that could be used unethically. Yep. So... There you go. A um, little bit of a brain teaser for us all. And that's really it for today's episode. Man, let me know what you think about this down in those comments because it is a fascinating topic. Um, funny enough, those of us who kind of exist at the consumer forefront of technology, which a lot of gaming actually is, um, well, we see what's coming around the horizon just a little bit sooner than everybody else. In many ways, that's a privilege. And as you see today, it's also somewhat of a burden. That's it for us, though. Have a nice day. We'll see you at the end of the world. Wow. <laughs>